English and Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, where she teaches courses in Latinx Literary and Cultural Studies, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Disability Studies. She has published scholarly articles in a number of journals and anthologies, including GLQ, Modern Fiction Studies, and the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies. Minnick is the author of Accessible Citizenships, Disability, Nation, and the Cultural Politics of Greater Mexico, published by Temple University Press in 2014, and winner of the 2013 to 2014 MLA Prize in United States Latina and Latino and Chicana and Chicano Literary and Cultural Studies. Minnick is currently completing a new book about compulsory able-bodiedness, Latinx literature, and racial health disparities, tentatively titled Enforceable Care, Health, Justice, and Latinx Expressive Culture. Ms. Kimmel, if you would like an access copy to follow along. So thank you. Um, Thank you so much to Jess for inviting me. Um, I'm really, really tremendously excited to be here. Um, thank you to WGSS for sponsoring this. Thank you to all of you for coming. Um, I appreciate your presence. So I'm going to start uh, with some stories that might seem like a strange opening. Uh, they address not Latinx literature, but political fights around the passage of the 2010 Affordable Care Act, and um, I'm figuring out where to stand, so definitely gesture to me if you need me to speed up, slow down, or stand closer or further away from the mic. Um, so the stories I'm about to tell address the political fights around the passage of the 2010 Affordable Care Act, the first law in the United States to approximate a guarantee of universal health coverage. On September 9, 2009, President Barack Obama delivered an address to a joint session of Congress to outline the proposal that led to this law. To the outrage of those of us who voted for Obama, hoping for more humane immigration policy, he made it a point to emphasize, the reforms I'm proposing would not apply to those who are here illegally. These words inspired a different outrage from South Carolina Republican Joe Wilson, who shouted from the floor, you lie. Wilson's outburst was widely criticized, taken at the time as a sign of disrespect for the office of the president by moderate Republicans and a sign of racial insult to the nation's first black president by those further left. In the rush to condemn Wilson, however, less attention was paid to the promise, which was decidedly not a lie, that prompted him to heckle the president. Many on the left were so excited by the prospect of passing a national health care law and so terrified of Republican efforts to derail it that it was presented as a given that, of course, the new law would exclude millions of people. Fast forward to 2017, when the Republican Party had retaken control of the presidency and both houses of Congress and identified repeal of the Affordable Care Act as its top priority. To support this goal, Republican lawmakers took to the news, characterizing those benefiting from the new law as irresponsible. Utah Republican Jason Chaffetz portrayed the law's beneficiaries as profligate gadget buyers. You know what? Americans have choices. And they've got to make a choice, he told CNN. And so maybe rather than getting that new iPhone that they just love and want to spend hundreds of dollars on, maybe they should invest in their own health care. Kansas Republican Roger Marshall, meanwhile, suggested that those who couldn't afford health care didn't want health care anyway. Just like Jesus said, the poor will always be with us, he told the health website stat. There's a group of people that just don't want health care and aren't going to take care of themselves. I think just morally, spiritually, socially, some people just don't want health care. The Medicaid population, which is on a free credit card as a group, do probably the least preventative medicine and taking care of themselves and eating healthy and exercising. Although neither mentioned race, their depictions of financial and physical negligence, coupled with code words like the Medicaid population, were widely interpreted to evoke long-standing racial stereotypes. I tell these stories not to incite 
head shaking at the state of public discourse in this country, but to make a point about the extent to which healthcare policies crafted on both the right and the left rely on two assumptions. One, that as desirable as universal health coverage might be from a public health standpoint, it is nonetheless morally and financially undesirable because some people will be a drain on the system and simply don't deserve health care. And two, that the undeserving, those most burdensome to the system, just happen to be overwhelmingly people of color. The former point, um, or the, the point that this is a widespread assumption, coincides with an argument made by historian Colin Gordon, who wrote a book called Dead on Arrival about the multiple failed efforts to create a national health care system in the United States over the course of the 20th century and ultimately concluded that, th that our healthcare system is actually designed to create distinctions between deserving and undeserving people. And then the latter point coincides with the work of legal scholars, historians, and sociologists like Dorothy Roberts, Alondra Nelson, Natalia Molina, John McKiernan Gonzalez, and Natalie Lira, whose research consistently shows that healthcare politics in the United States have long been linked, directly and indirectly, to concerns about race and immigration. Even when race is not directly mentioned, the so-called undeserving are unfailingly presented as those with conditions believed to result from irresponsible choices, fatness, diabetes, heart disease, sexually transmitted diseases, high-risk or stigmatized pregnancies, and atypical neuropathways that have a disproportionate effect in communities of color and that are used to reinforce long-standing beliefs about these communities as lazy or deviant. This context, in which racial health disparities are used as affirmation of racial stereotypes, is the larger context for my remarks today. So part one, enforceable care, health justice, and Latinx expressive culture. This talk is drawn from a book I'm writing, which is tentatively titled Enforceable Care, Health Justice, and Latinx Expressive Culture. And it examines how Latinx expressive culture, including literature, film, and visual art, responds to racial health disparities within the socio-political climate that I just described. This book covers a span of time between 1990 and the present, or more precisely, it begins in the year that the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed and during a time when HIV AIDS activists, whose work laid the foundation for contemporary struggles for a national health care system, were at the peak of their public visibility. And it continues into our present day moment um, and its battles over the state of national health care. The Latinx writers and artists that I discuss in the book all focus on what social scientists call the social determinants of health, or the factors beyond individual control that affect physical and mental well-being. Their work prompts us to ask questions about access to things like nutritious food, medical care and information, clean air and water, and cultural representations portraying one's life as valuable and worth living. Furthermore, these writers and artists show how the stigma attached to certain health conditions replicates long-standing constructions of racialized minorities and the poor as negligent and thus undeserving of social benefits. Finally, these texts depict the health of vulnerable communities as a collective social concern instead of blaming personal choices for health disparities. As a concrete example, today I will present material from a chapter on poetry and performance art addressing diabetes in Texas Latinx communities. First though, I want to elaborate two central arguments of the book and also to discuss one of the major challenges that I face in writing it. Oh, wrong, wrong direction, sorry. So the first of these two arguments is that literature and art offer an important but underutilized resource for the study of health inequity and that the methods of literary and cultural criticism serve public health researchers. So I'm not just a humanities scholar, I am a cheerleader for the scholarly methods of the humanities. Um, and I believe that the humanities is not just a boutique field uh, for the cultured elite, but a resource for social change. I also believe that the potential of the humanities to affect social change is why uh, the humanities are so often under attack. One of my mentors, uh, the Chicana literary critic Paula Moya, 
who happens to be a member of the class of 1991 of the University of Houston, <laughs> offers a definition of literature as a social institution that captures what I'm trying to elaborate here. <coughs> she writes, literature is a dynamic system of communication through which the manifold ideologies that shape and motivate humans' diverse cultural practices are circulated. A close reading of a work of literature can thus serve as an excavation of and a meditation on the pervasive sociocultural ideas, such as race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality, of the social worlds in which both readers and authors live. While Moya is specifically interested in literature, I believe that her argument can apply to other art forms, including performance, visual art, and film. Further expanding her argument, I am interested in another ideological structure beyond race, gender, and sexuality that she does not mention, an ideological structure that few perceive as ideological, health. So in calling health an ideology, I'm relying on the work of Jonathan Metzl, who writes, health is a desired state, but it is also a prescribed state and an ideological position. We realize this dichotomy every time we see someone smoking a cigarette and reflexively say, smoking is bad for your health, when what we really mean is, you are a bad person because you smoke. Even the most cursory examinations of health in daily conversation, email solicitation, or media representation demonstrates how the term is used to make moral judgments, convey prejudice, sell products, or even to exclude whole groups of persons from healthcare. Bringing together the work of Moya and Metzl, I contend that analysis of health in contemporary literature and art helps to make visible its ideological function in our social world. In other words, I see literature and, and art as a kind of health intervention, not an individual intervention, wherein reading the right kind of poetry will stabilize blood pressure or lower cholesterol, but a societal health intervention through which we are able to recognize and challenge harmful and prevailing health ideologies. <coughs> because the analysis of cultural artifacts requires simultaneous examination of individual behaviors as well as larger collective belief systems, the methods of cultural criticism can foster a more comprehensive understanding of the causes of unequal health outcomes and promote more equitable healthcare systems. My second argument, um, and this is a part that I'm sort of still working through, um, is that contemporary Latinx expressive culture is a particularly important resource for understanding and combating some of the most dangerous health ideologies and policies affecting the United States. In making this claim, I wanna quickly offer a caveat. Latinx communities are not the only communities affected by racial health disparities and some Latinx communities are actually less affected by certain kinds of health inequities than other minority groups. Therefore, Latinx expressive culture is not the only kind of expressive culture that I see as necessary for understanding health disparities. The study of African American, Native American, and Asian American literature and culture is equally crucial for a comprehensive understanding of racialized health inequity. But I also believe and this is why I began my talk today with the debate over whether or not undocumented people would receive health care through the Affordable Care Act, that we cannot understand contemporary health care debates without also understanding their imbrication with immigration policy and vice versa, and particularly without understanding how anti-immigrant sentiment is mobilized against a health care law that benefits millions of citizens. So while I don't believe that it is sufficient to only look at Latinx artistic expression in order to understand health disparities, I do believe that understanding the particular and specific ways in which Latinx people are racialized in this historical moment means that Latinx writers and artists have developed aesthetic strategies for combating the stereotype of Latinx people as a drain on the healthcare system, aesthetic strategies that are needed for broad-based struggles for health justice. So my hope for the book is that it will be relevant beyond the context of Latinx literary criticism, that it will be useful to scholars in other ethnic studies fields as well as to public health and policy researchers, even as it is rooted in the study of Latinx literature and culture. And then a final comment I'd like to make 
uh, before moving on to my case study, concerns a particular challenge that I face in making these arguments, which specifically concerns my use of a body of cultural theory known as disability theory. Most of my scholarly work to date has been classified as disability studies work. And yet in this talk, I will hardly use the word disability at all. I have found that in order to engage critically with racial health disparities means that I also have to engage critically with disability rights discourses that celebrate the variation of, hum of disabled and non-disabled bodies and minds, but don't critically interrogate the social formations that make some people more vulnerable than others to acquiring disabilities, namely poor and working class people and people of color. On one hand, my training in disability studies allows me to challenge the pathologizing rhetoric that blames working class communities of color for their unequal health, comes, health outcomes, and to look for critiques of a society that treats health as the result of personal choices. But the suspicion with which disability scholars often regard medicalization has left me at times poorly equipped to address the struggles for equitable healthcare access in the Latinx texts I study. Simply put, many of these texts seek access to the very same medical institutions that many mainstream disability scholars reject. Um, I align myself in this project with the work of disability scholars like Sammy Schock, who has identified a move in the field away from more strictly medical, legal, and identity-based definitions of disability as an object of analysis and suggests that we understand disability studies as a methodological approach to studying power, privilege, and oppression of bodily and mental norms, which is not dependent upon the presence of disabled people, yet is informed by social perspectives, practices, and concerns about disability. Like Shock, in this book, I am less concerned with whether my objects of study contain references to conditions commonly classified as disabilities, and more concerned with the socially constructed system of norms which categorizes and values body minds. So diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States and the sixth leading cause of death in the state of Texas. In South Texas, a predominantly Latinx region of the state, one in nine adults lives with a diagnosis of diabetes. With proper medical support, diabetes can be managed. And yet Latinx people are one and a half times more likely to die of diabetes related causes than whites. It feels urgent to state these statistics, which seem to me like obvious evidence of the physical consequences of <coughs> racial inequity. Yet to proclaim them also feels risky <coughs> in a post affordable health care political landscape of health surveillance, in which the vulnerability of Latinx people to diabetes is construed by the Jason Chaffetz and Roger Marshalls of the world as the very reason why they should not receive health care. The stereotype that type 2 diabetes is the result of careless health behaviors. Meanwhile, I am also uneasy with liberal discourse promoting science as the antidote. For some, the way to counter victim blaming rhetoric is to note rightfully that type 2 diabetes is in many cases not linked to lifestyle factors, but is hereditary. Yet recourse to genetic arguments is also risky, as medical anthropologist Michael Montoya argues in his book, Making the Mexican Diabetic, Race, Science, and the Genetics of Inequality. Research into the genetic causes of type 2 diabetes may seem to relieve blame for those affected by the disease, but frequently reifies the biologization of race, reviving long debunked myths that people of different races are biologically different from one another. I am unwilling to slide down this slippery slope. Rather, I propose that since medical or genetic science does not by itself resolve these debates, we might turn instead to literature and art as another important intervention to help us reframe how we understand the prevalence of diabetes in this moment and the kinds of solutions we might imagine for this public health crisis. To make this case, the first text I will explore is the Panza Monologues, which was written as a solo performance piece by Virginia Grice and Irma Mayorga, while the two worked together at the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center in San Antonio. The piece is now available for purchase as a book, 
And my slide here shows the cover of that book, which shows a black and white photo of a young girl on a swing against a lavender background. There's also a limited edition performance DVD mainly available to academic libraries. In their introduction to the second edition, Grice and Mayorga explain. Panza is the Spanish word for belly. Usually it suggests a big belly, a round protruding belly, but skinny people use the word too. It can be used with affection, a way to indicate that there's more, around, more of you around to love, especially around your midsection, or cruelly, that you have a pot-bellied paunch for a stomach. The term does not discriminate. Both sexes and all genders can have a panza. That's part of its cultural brilliance. Our play spins out the words, widens its possibility to think about bellies and bodies, the rise of obesity among Latinas and Latinos, the conditions in people's lives. In our eyes, panza is a catalyst for looking at the social, political, geographic, and historical significance of women, of Latinas and Latinos, of ourselves. So the title of the Panza monologues might at first seem to indicate a mere expansion of Eve Ensler's famous theater piece, The Vagina Monologues, which I don't have time to delineate the many reasons why these are, two, these are very different works <laughs> here. Um, but I do want to mention that the bilingualism of the title indicates a highly specific experience of racialized embodiment. So again, I quote Grice and Mayorga. We couldn't help but think that a predominance of obesity and poverty were somehow linked to the disenfranchisement of generations of Tejanas and Tejanos that has had an impact on our cultura economically, legally, spatially, physically, and also psychically. Our panzas were not only a matter of individual responsibility in regard to health and diet, but also deeply connected to the material, spatial, historical, and embodied legacies we have lived as Tejanas. As you can see from these excerpts, Grice and Mayorga are largely concerned with combating racialized fat phobia and embracing Latinx bodily diversity. In the context of this project, they address diabetes in one monologue, titled My Sister's Panza, that I will discuss today. My Sister's Panza begins. My sister lost her panza, lost it because of her husband. It left because he left her. These lines seem to predict a story of feminist anger over male-defined beauty norms, but the monologue itself actually quickly gets much more complex. She'd had that panza ever since she was seven, when she was all heat and baby fat. Seven, when she slowly became more and more thirsty each day, itching for water at every moment and then she'd pee hot streams of burnt yellow every 30 minutes, until finally mommy took her in to see the doctor man. After the sister is diagnosed with diabetes, the figure of the ex-husband in the present is overshadowed by that of the doctor man in the past, as the narrator continues. Our Mexicana mother didn't know what he meant when he said we had too much of us around to love. To save us, we had to change everything. All our comidas had to change now, today, this minute. No more tortillas de harina smeared with butter. No more barbacoa Sundays or arroz con pollo Fridays. No more capirotada piled five layers high. No more ice cream man bells. And although the sister successfully manages her diabetes into adulthood, she keeps her panza until her husband leaves. At which point the narrator tells us, she stopped eating until every roll of her panza was gone. She measured her blood sugar to find sky high readings of sugar, sugar, sugar. And I know, as she slid the needle under her skin, she wondered how much it would take to take away the panza pain for good. One day she turned sideways and you'd never even know she'd, had a, she'd even had a panza. I wonder if the doctor would think she'd done enough to con help control the sugar sweetness of her diabetes now. So although the passages I've just read might seem deceptively simple, they contain a wealth of information about experiences of diabetes. First, the choice of words like doctor man and the use of code switching establishes the atmosphere of racialized distrust between the doctor and the family. The bilingual sentence, all our comidas had to change, 
contains a particularly effective mid-sentence code switch that conveys not only how the family understands its food practices as intimately linked to cultural expression, but also how the doctor's criticism of the family's diet is perceived as a cultural devaluation. Yet even as it critiques the doctor, the passage does not shy away from acknowledging a diet rich in processed carbohydrates and saturated fats. Flour tortillas with butter, slow cooked beef cheeks, bread pudding, ice cream. As the narrator reveals, these meals are a source of pride for the mother, but also linked to the malnutrition of the narrator and her sister. Our panzas, they are what told our mother that her kids were never over her dead body going to starve, even if we sometimes did. These lines, along with the use of code switching, demonstrate how food conveys intimacy and love in the face of economic and social precarity that make changing diets a much more complex inter interaction than simply ordering a mother to change the way she feeds her children. So um, my analysis of this particular quote actually talks about a lot of social science research um, about why the doctor's approach to just telling the mother to change the comida is wrong. Um, but I cut that out, so I'm happy to return to that in the Q&A so as not to get really bogged down in uh, social science-y stuff. Uh, finally, the monologue intervenes in a widely held misperception that managing diabetes equates to weight loss. After the sister begins to treat her diabetes, she remains panzona. Furthermore, weight loss alone does not reverse diabetes. Even as her panza disappears, the sister finds sky-high readings of sugar in her blood. So in this way, my sister's panza confronts the crisis of diabetes among poor and working class Latinx communities, but resists prescribing weight loss as the sole answer to a much more complex health phenomenon. The monologue is a complex representation of diabetes that engages not only with high risk behaviors, but also with the social conditions in which those behaviors occur. Social conditions that include not just poverty and lack of food security, but also the familial love and warmth that persists despite those conditions. The narrator does not deny that the food her family consumes may have contributed to the sister's diabetes, but she insists that her sister's struggle to preserve her health cannot be separated from a social context represented by both the doctor man and the unfaithful husband that have treated her sister's body as unworthy of love and care. A more extensive exploration of diabetes as a racialized health crisis in Texas can be found in the amazing, amazing 2015 poetry collection, Blood Sugar Canto, by Austin-based poet Irene Lara Silva. And I just want to put in a plug for this book. Um, if any of my words today resonate and you have the resources, purchasing this book supports a very important Texas Latina artist. Um, I'm showing an image of the book cover now. The cover art is an abstract image made of blue, white, and red dots in a floral pattern on a green background created by her artist brother who shares her diagnosis. Dedicated to everyone with diabetes and everyone who loves them, this remarkable collection is an intimate, um, is an intimate and moving exploration of Latina experiences of diabetes covering everything from familial relationships to food injustice to sexuality from the perspective of a diabetic Latina whose family and community have been devastated by the disease. And if I could, I would just read the entire book today. <laughs> um, but since time won't allow for that, I'm going to offer brief analyses of four particularly moving poems. So the first pair of poems that I'm going to discuss addresses doctor-patient relationships. These are called We Don't Give Morphine for Heartburn and Grace. So the first, We Don't Give Morphine for Heartburn, uh, describes an experience in which the, sister, the speaker's brother, a young brown-skinned man with scars and tattoos, goes to four different doctors in excruciating pain and is turned away each time assuming, assumed to be drug-seeking with the words, We Don't Give Morphine for Heartburn. On his fifth visit to the emergency room, he finally encounters a doctor who agrees to admit him to the hospital schedules him for surgery and offers this diagnosis. He was diabetic and had blood, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. The poem is, is addressed to the first doctor who turns him away. It is searing and relentless in its rage. 
beginning with the line, Dr. Dos Santos, you would have left my brother to die, and ending with the line, I cannot forgive you, doctor. I will never forgive you. I hope you burn in hell. The poem Grace, which follows only four poems later, strikes a markedly or an apparently markedly different tone. In this poem, the speaker goes to a medical appointment and is filled with shame when the physician's assistant asks her to remove her shoes. Immediately apologizing for not having had a pedicure, she is shocked when the physician's assistant treats her feet gently and respectfully, a completely new experience. After years of the doctor turning away while I removed my shoes, years of them wincing and trying not to touch my skin with their gloved hands, my still strong and sensitive feet made ugly. In this poem, the physician's assistant's adherence to the basic standards of professionalism is experienced by the speaker as a gift, as humble and great a gift as if she had washed my feet with her hair. This was a kind of grace, my feet in her hands. How gently she put my socks back on again, how she slipped my shoes back on, how she too saw the beauty of my simple feet. This poem might seem to represent the opposite experience of that presented in We Don't Give Morphine for Heartburn, a simple story of good doctor versus bad doctor. Um, but the power of the second poem comes from the fact that the speaker's experience with a medical professional who treats her respectfully is not typical. It is also significant that the professional in this poem is not a physician, but a physician's assistant. So what I want to emphasize about these poems is how both reveal a systemic disregard within the medical profession for racialized diabetic bodies. Both poems show that efforts to reform the medical profession must focus beyond the individual. It's not just about identifying the good doctors and the bad doctors, um, or to just hope to encounter an understanding doctor. In these poems, it is doctor after doctor after doctor who treats the characters depicted as disposable. The next poem I wish to discuss, titled En Trozos in Pieces, brings me back to the point I made earlier in the talk about how certain versions of disability studies scholarship and disability activism can seem to work at odds with struggles for health justice. In this poem, the speaker recounts the amputations that have occurred in her family as a result of diabetes. Her maternal grandmother's toe, her tia Lupe's toes, feet, legs, and finally fingers, her father's feet. The speaker says that what her father feared most was to go in pieces. Now I fear it too. She professes a desire to be as strong as her tia Lupe, but confesses the terror of being devoured, one limb not being enough to satiate the beast. At first, these lines about the fear of amputation seem irreconcilable with a politics of disability pride described by the disabled activist and writer Eli Clare as follows. Declaring disability a matter of social justice is an important act of resistance. Disability residing not in paralysis, but in stairs without an accompanying ramp, not in blindness, but in the lack of braille and audiobooks, not in dyslexia, but in teaching methods unwilling to flex. In this declaration, disability politics joins other social change movements in the ongoing work of locating the problems of injustice not in individual body minds, but in the world. To be sure, many people with disabilities have been irreparably harmed by a society more prepared to alter or stigmatize their bodies than to accommodate them. At the same time, however, as I argued at the beginning of this talk, some of us, Eli Clare included, uh, believe that the purpose of disability justice is not simply to celebrate disability but also to critically scrutinize its causes and how it is unevenly distributed across populations. So for the speaker of this poem, who inherits generations of medical neglect, justice resides not only in the creation of wheelchair ramps for family members who have undergone amputations, but also in ac access to treatment for those who have not. Furthermore, the poem shows that these two goals are not mutually exclusive. It ends with the speaker declaring her love for her own body. Oh body, cuerpecito mio, how many years I wasted not loving you, judging you for what they said you lacked, for what you were too much of, 
too big, too dark, too fat, too short, tu India. Oh body, cuerpecito mío, I will never see you through their eyes again. I will learn to take care of you as I have learned to love you. No terror, no terror, only love. What I find important about these lines is the way the speaker ultimately does not qualify her love for her body. She does not say, I will love you as long as you remain whole. She doesn't even say, I will take care of you so that you will not undergo amputation. She simply says, I will learn to take care of you, suggesting a commitment to loving her body and, take, and to care for it through the many shapes it may take on its journey through life. She is done judging her body through others' eyes. So to conclude, I turn to the book's title poem, Blood Sugar Canto, which exemplifies my argument by presenting the diabetic Latinx body as a site of structural injustice, but also as socially and politically valuable and as a site of love. So the first half of the poem describes living with diabetes as a constant battle of necessity versus necessity. The speaker offers an excruciating list, a box of syringes versus gas money, the price of sufficient insulin against the cost of groceries, testing strips and lancets versus the light bill, the cost of one healthy meal versus the cost of three fast food meals, another copay and another copay versus the cost of not seeing the doctor. Against those who would place the blame for diabetes on those living with the disease, like perhaps the doctor man from, La, from the Panza monologues, Silva's speaker insists that it is not as simple, this line is always hard to say, it is not as simple as eat this, not that, eat that, not this. Take this, not that, not, take that, not this. Do this, not that, do that, not this. The poem thus reminds us to direct our critical scrutiny, not at those living with diabetes, but at the social conditions that force people to make untenable choices. Yet for Silva, diabetes is not only about poverty and medical neglect, but also about acquiring a new relationship to her body. Silva's speaker insists upon the importance of learning to listen to your body and your blood until you are the one writing the song. And the daily challenges are the discordant notes you must work into the score, making something more beautiful than what was there before. Not planned, not wanted, but more powerful because it is truth. These are, of course, the lines that give the poem and the book itself its title. This is the blood sugar canto of the entire collection. Using the metaphor of song to describe diabetes, Silva is not downplaying its devastation or celebrating its occurrence. However, she is reminding us that illness is an important and unavoidable part of life. It constitutes the discordant notes of the canto of our lives the daily challenges that make the entire song more beautiful. Not planned, not wanted, but more, beautiful, more powerful because it is truth. Imagining diabetes as music requires loving the diabetic body, loving diabetic communities, believing that those most, effective, most affected deserve the best possible resources to care for their bodies no matter what, to enact the love that allows this music, this blood sugar canto, to do its work, requires working against powerful cultural scripts. Again, I quote from the poem. I know no one said we were worthy of love. No one said we were precious or that our lives were gifts. No one said, let us learn to love ourselves. The love evoked in these lines stands in powerful contrast to the ideology of health I evoked at the beginning of this talk the ideology that some people simply deserve to not receive health care. This ideology of health that cannot be our only means of understanding diabetes in a social world that is structured to make all of us more vulnerable to it, and some of us particularly so. I want to highlight the plural pronouns used by the speaker in these lines, particularly as they contrast to the singular language of neoliberal individualism that dominates public discourse around health. We are worthy of love, the speaker tells us. We are precious. Our lives are gifts. Speaker Silva insists that the love that contests this individuation 
must be collective and communal. It's not about making an individual personal choice to eat carrots instead of Cheetos, the because I'm worth it, neoliberal self-improvement of the Weight Watchers slogan. It's about entire communities that have been deemed unworthy of love in the larger national imaginary. For Silva's speaker, reimagining diabetes is not merely an aesthetic exercise, although it is that, but it is also a process of unlearning the isolating and alienating language of neoliberal healthcare, the destructive metaphors of illness, the social narratives that portray entire communities as undeserving of health and of love. Silva's Blood Sugar Canto is one opening effort of a new song. I have no better words than those of Silva's speaker, so I will end this talk with her lines. I will begin here with these lines. Learning love one utterance at a time. I will make song. Thank you. Yes, Trevor. Um, so I noticed both of these um, works are by Texas artists. So I'm wondering, is the book focused on Texas or the US in general? So the question was um, because um, these two are focused on Texas, whether the book um, is about Texas or the US in general. The book is about the US um, in general. This section of the chapter is on Texas, but um, I'm also kind of um, in early stages of, of research um, to talk about, because one of the things that has really struck me uh, since Hurricane Maria in uh, Puerto Rico is um, with the lack, the ongoing, you know, over six months now of lack of power in Puerto Rico, one of the things that has come up over and over um, is people's inability to refrigerate their insulin. Um, and so, so the rest of the chapter um, will go beyond Texas, but I do, also want to try to sort of maintain um, a sense of texture and specificity of place. And I currently have the Texas part more worked out. Yes. Yeah. So there was a lot um, in that question, but the question was kind of about uh, curanderismo and what its role might be. And I definitely think um, that there needs to be a role beyond just um, beyond just sort of the medical profession. I think that um, this chapter gives like a strong sense of problems within medical science and in the medical profession um, that make relying on medical science alone um, difficult. At the same time, I mean, I think that it is not counterintuitive to expand access to respectful and um, adequate medical care, right, at the same time as one is also expanding ideas about what healing can be, right? I think it becomes a problem when people only have access to one or the other, right? If people only have access to curanderos and not doctors, um, or vice versa, I think, right? Because what a curandero or a curandera can offer is a kind of affirmation, right, of um, precisely the question of like, um, kind of a validating form of care. Right, so I think, I think that access to both is necessary. I also think you brought up Gloria Ansaldúa and something that I'm really trying to work through um, for the larger version of this chapter is Gloria Ansaldúa's 
um, writings on her own experience of diabetes. So something that I think is really important um, in a lot of the research I've been uncovering about diabetes, there's a huge tendency to kind of mark a difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, and so type 1 diabetes is, there, there are actually people within the type 1 uh, community who want to reclassify type 1 diabetes as an autoimmune disorder only and not have it be called diabetes anymore because of the stigma of diabetes, right? Um, but what fascinates me about the work of Gloria Antaldúa, a lot of people think that because she was diagnosed as an adult that she was type 1, or that she was type 2, but she was actually type 1. Um, and her work refuses to mark that distinction. Um, so, so I also think that her work um, is a really important, I think, gesture toward thinking about what a politics around diabetes can mean. Um, you and then, hi. Um, okay, so I appreciate the um, earlier on when you made the distinction between how liberals and conservatives approach diabetes and public health in general. Uh, but I was wondering, out of personal curiosity, and you might have touched on this before I got here, is there, is there a lot of talk of policies, progressive policies, um, considering that it's 2018, is there a certain policy that you, that, that you're trying to encourage and or have you reached out to this particular, since you're in Austin, reached out to particular policy makers regarding public health and specifically diabetes or public health in general for minority communities? So this, um, this question was about like policy and what, what kinds of policy can help and what kinds of policy um, organizations I've reached out to. And I haven't done a lot of direct work um, with policy organizations, and that's partly, I mean, I'm making this really strong claim for literature as an intervention, but I also um, am aware that, that that is not something that people jump to and receive. So my goal is to work toward that, but my goal is also to kind of um, get my arguments as firm as possible before I start doing that work. I have some colleagues um, who are public health scholars and they're kind of helping me um, refine the way that I'm talking about this. Um, but I am really trying to, for instance, get courses where I teach like this particular book, um, Blood Sugar Canto, like get those courses to count for pre-med requirements and get pre-med majors in my classes. So that's where I'm starting right now, um, is to kind of talk to students who are, who are hoping to go into medical professions um, about understanding health more complexly. Um, regarding the question of policy and the reason why I kind of talk about policy on the right and on the left, um, and this is something that I wasn't able to put into words in exactly this way until after I had written the talk. Um, but I was kind of trying to think about why it is that, I mean, I am critical of both policy on the right and on the left. And one of the things that I sort of realized um, was that a lot of policy on both sides tends to mistrust the choices that poor people, and particularly poor people of color, make about their own health care. Um, so even on the left, there's a lot of stuff, um, a lot of policy right now, like soda taxes, right, which has not hit Texas, but is like all over California, where people are starting to tax soda. And I mean, I'm all for like having soda corporations like experience a debt in their profits, like I'm fine with that. But what I'm not okay with is the assumption that like people are making choices about what to eat and drink based on like not knowing their correct information or that people have to be coerced into making particular kinds of choices. So I'm interested in policy um, that starts from a position that people are making the best choices they can within the resources available to them and that what we need to do is expand the resources available. Um, well, I mean, one example of what it looks like 
is that from a public health perspective, it makes no sense that we have this law, the Affordable Care Act, that isn't available to 11 million people because they're undocumented. Like, it makes sense from an economic standpoint of like, um, our government doesn't want to pay for everybody to have health care. But from a public health standpoint, like you can't have a population maintained in its maximum state of health without giving everybody access to health care. Um, so that's one thing is that I think that everybody should have access to, to health care, like no questions asked. Um, I know that that's like a super pie in the sky. <laughs> like it's not, you know, I, I want to say it may not happen in my lifetime, but I want to be part of the effort to build an argument for why that needs to be um, the way we do healthcare in this country. Thank you so much. I don't think I can summarize the, com the comment, but thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for your talk. I'm going to represent our teacher department officially. I'm also writing a book on diabetes, uh, a much longer book from the turn of the 20th century through uh, Hurricane Katrina. I have two questions. You probably answered one of them. Um, I, too, was very interested in that conversation around what one newspaper called the Diabetes Civil War, which is sort of, as you mentioned, sort of this attempt by uh, type 1 diabetics to completely separate themselves um, by suggesting that they're a completely different disease. And I, I agree. I think you, you see these examples of type 1 and type 2 merging. Um, I'm looking at a case now where these jazz musicians who, um, the, the assumption was that they were type 2 but in reality, they could have been type one, but because they were jazz musicians in the 1960s, the perception was that they were heroin addicts, right? So you have a sort of an, another layer sort of added on to that. But do you, did you see any tension between uh, sort of you know, type one and, and type two in, in the literature that you've looked at so far? I mean, this one example, you know, it's not as easy as eat this or eat that. In some ways, that, that sort of hints at some of you know these frustrations and these tensions between um, the different types and this perception that some type one diabetics have. Well, it doesn't matter what we. I mean, we should eat well, of course, but our what, what we have going on is completely different, and they don't want to be tied into sort of the moral judgments of type two. Um, 
The second question is, I was also looking, and this was more in the 1960s and um, 1970s, about differences in amputation rates, mm. right? Um, and then this perception that presenting the same symptoms that African Americans might have lived amputated at a rate higher than, than whites. Um, and so I was wondering if you saw any of that um, in, your, in your analysis or, or reading. So um, that was two questions. One was just asking for further discussion of the type one versus type two distinction. And the other um, was an amazing question about um, differences in amputation rates, um, suggesting that there's evidence of, of differences um, in between um, African Americans and whites and asking about Latinx people. Um, I also want to say, Dr. Mazel, I'm like so happy that you're here. You gave a talk at UT a few months ago and I was teaching during your talk. Um, I really, really wanted to go and I've been um, kind of watching your work and like, um, so yeah, so I'm really excited about the project you're doing. Um, and so um, the first the first one about type one and type two, um, I actually have not seen that distinction in the literature. And I want to make the case um, that in the literature, not necessarily um, you know, in public, but, but the fact that it is not mentioned in the literature when it is mentioned so much in public discourse is in and of itself a political thing in the literature. Like, so for instance, the fact that Ansaldúa, Gloria Ansaldúa never specifies that she has type 1 diabetes, um, that the only way you find that out is by actually going like to her archive and kind of where she has her medical records, um, but she doesn't bring it up in her, in her literature at all. Like to me, that is, that is political. And similarly, um, I think that you know, in the, the poetry collection, Blood Sugar Canto, um, you know, the poet is talking about generations of her family, right? But she, she is avoiding making a, instead of making an argument about diabetes, even type two, as hereditary, instead she's making an argument about generations of medical neglect, and that that's where she's putting her emphasis. So it, it doesn't come up in the literature, but that doesn't mean I don't think it's important. I think it's important precisely that um, these writers are choosing not to make it important um, and are asking us to look at a kind of bigger picture. Your question about um, amputation is amazing. I haven't looked into it, and now I'm like immediately going to. So I really appreciate that. So it is not currently, um, which is not to say that it can't be. Um, I think there's a part, um, the part in the Pansa monologues where she says, um, our bellies were what told our mother we were never over her dead body going to starve. Um, I am looking at sort of um, some social science research around income level and diet. Um, and there are all kinds of studies about like why, um, why there's a high correlation between like um, um, dietary intake of things like sugar, right, and income level. Um, and one, one newer study is suggesting that um, in addition to you know, food availability, um, there's also just that lower income parents have less, so, so all parents, um, anybody in this room who's a parent knows this, like children ask their parents for things like all the time. Um, <laughs> and higher income parents have the ability to say yes 
to the big things that their kids ask them for. So like vacations and cool new sneakers. Um, but lower income parents who need to be able to say yes to their children just as much as, as higher income parents have less ability to say yes to the big things. And so sugar is available, right, and is a way for parents to say yes to their children. Um, so that's the closest that I get to like kind of looking at the, the wider availability of sugar, um, is like kind of just talking about, again, like I think the mother is, she's not making bad choices, it's just that she doesn't have like better choices available to her, right, in the sense of like, um, you know, she would say yes to her children um, for, you know, if they asked for vacations and things like that, if she could. Um, so I worry about sort of getting, I don't know, I, I have to kind of decide how much I want to go into um, go into questions of like the the ways in which sugar is being processed and the history of it because I on the one hand I think it's totally relevant and on the other hand I worry that like addressing it in the wrong way sort of contributes to this idea of that I'm trying to avoid of like um, you know people's individual choices. I'm not answering your question very well because it's like something I'm really wrestling with and I have to actually write the chapter to figure out how much of it goes in there. I guess my question, I, I, I wasn't, I'm thinking more about, this, you know, it seems like there's been so misrepresent, much misrepresentation of what sugar is. It's yeah. It's either convenient. People, the scientists said it was fat that was making people uh, yeah. ill and Yeah. I read sugar to falsify information so that, anyway, it just seems yeah. to be relevant somehow, but I'm not sure exactly. Maybe it's just a separate issue. Yeah, I don't think it's separate. Um, but I also think I have to do more work to figure out like precisely how it fits. Julie, thank you. Been and Lisa was amazing. And as a colonial Latin American scholar, the word shame, you know, stayed in my mind. And uh, because, as you know, honor the, the honor versus shame dichotomy, and uh, and I think that 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 carried on through the you know the idea of that. Is there anything that the shaming in in the people's body and, and and also the control of the body and telling you what is right and wrong is sort of like a colonial. Thing, and I appreciate that you mentioned it. And I was just wanted to hear so sort of like your, your thoughts more about you know the, the, the issue of shame, shaming and the coloniality, the coloniality aspect. That's an amazing question. Um, and I think um, like shame is operating um, in multiple levels in the text I'm looking at, like in terms of, for instance, like um, in the first text, the doctor shaming um, the mother, right, for the way that she's, she's feeding her children, um, but also operating on these, on these other levels of like, like the, the poem Grace where she says, where she talks about embarrassment for not having a pedicure. Right, and like what does, what does a pedicure really have to do um, with medical treatment or how someone deserves medical treatment, um, but what it has to do with, and the reason why shame comes into play, right, is precisely the colonial dynamic that you're talking about um, of the idea of certain bodies as holding shame right, um, and as being 
undesirable and untouchable, right? Um, I really like, I really like the way that you specifically um, talk about coloniality um, because there's a lot like in the Silva collection, like there's a lot of poems that specifically name colonial processes and name also processes of decolonization. Um, and I think that you've given me like a really helpful way of thinking about those poems um, in the larger chapter. Do you do, um, do, do, do you do the same analysis with other genders? So I think, I think, I, I think like the side of resistance for women, especially you know, using the, the narrative, right, to, to talk about these issues, especially in the body. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and maybe work with other, other genders? So, yeah, that's an amazing question um, because um, I haven't found texts um, by people who don't identify as women. Um, you do? That would be awesome. Uh, Javier Huerta. Javier Huerta. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. Because because Silva, right, like talks about her father and she talks about her brother especially. Um, so she's not specifically, um, she's not solely concerned um, with, with women as a category. But I do think, I do think that there is also, and it's, it's not really about men versus women, but I think that there's something about hierarchies of gender, like the way that the doctor in the Fonsa monologues is called the doctor man um, and is talking to a mother and to sisters, right? Like I think, I think that what, what the writers are doing with that gender distinction is more about thinking about other axes on which bodies are valued and categorized rather than trying to, to mark men versus women, mm -hmm. per se. Yeah. To add to that, not to make like the issue of health binary, because it, it's not, it's important to everybody, but with, with that being said, um, oftentimes, like when it comes to health and taking care of yourself and providing nutrition and nurturing and all that, it does fall on a female, and I do mean like traditional female matriarchy like roles. Like if, if you're going to take care of yourself or when you look at different Latino or minority communities in general, who is the person who's taking care of the health of the family, including the man? It's typically the mother or sister or aunt or grandmother, and I mean that in like a traditional female role. So it does, it makes sense that um, the narratives tend to be more female, but then again, but then like thinking about the policy side as well, even though women traditional traditionally women are the ones who are navigating health policy, you know what I mean? Like, can I, can I take my kids to the doctor? They need a shot, blah, 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 blah. I need to go grocery shopping, whatever. Um, when it comes to like creating policy or like when, it, you know what I mean? Like creating policy mm -hmm. that affects the health of your family, I don't see many female policy writers unless I've been living under a brick. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's an interesting dichotomy. Many more women are taking care of the health of the family in minority cultures across the board, whereas it's typically white men specifically are creating policy regarding health of the minority community. Yes, yes. So like caretaking labor is feminized. And medical and policy labor is masculinized, right? Which is not to say um, that only women do caretaking and only men do policy and medical practicing, but it, me, practicing, I'm not sure if that's actually a word, but medical practice, right? Um, but it is to say that 
that labor is highly, highly gendered, and then it's paid accordingly, right? So, um, so healthcare workers who keep people alive, um, or caretaking, like caretaking labor, like that caretaking labor, right, which sustains people, is not compensated um, in the same way that writing policy and writing prescriptions is compensated. Thank you so much to everyone.